Before the success stories, the progress, there was you. You who made a choice to grow, to inspire, to overcome your own challenges. At NASM, we're in service of your limitless potential because when you keep growing, we all get stronger and we'll never stop making your journey our mission. Join the fitness leader. Become a fitness leader. Become a certified personal trainer. You're listening to the Peak Physique Podcast with Andre Adams on the NASM Podcast Network. Hey guys, welcome back to the NASM Peak Physique Podcast. I'm your host, Andre Adams, NASM Master Trainer and IFBB Physique Olympian. And I'm joined today once again by my good friend, Miss Ashley Kaltwasser, three times as bikini champ. Hello, hello. Super excited for this episode. It's aloha today. Aloha. All right, we are and in then Hawaii. And soon it will be konnichiwa. Konnichiwa, oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. See, we're learning, we're learning. Thank goodness for Google Translate, right? <laughs> so we're going to give you guys a little flavor of what we have going on this week. We had some pretty awesome events down here in Hawaii. Shout out to our good friends, Greg and Rose at GY Fitness. I'm sure. I'm yes, sure. she's actually representing today. That's our home base whenever we're here in Hawaii. But we did an awesome fitness seminar that was actually sponsored by NASM in partnership with the Sean Ray Hawaiian Classic. We had other guest speakers come out, our good friend, Dr. Indy. Shout out to Dr. Indy Vasquez. And, you know, we covered a lot of different topics, but some of it was more kind of holistic health and wellness related. We talked about HTMA mineral analysis and how we can leverage things like blood oxidation type for physique outcomes. So that was kind of the sweet science. You guys know I'm a geek for science. And then after that, we actually dived into contest prep specifically and Ashley, Sean, myself, we talked about everything from that kind of NPC to IFBB journey, what that looks like, a little bit of motivation, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, what was your favorite part of this weekend? Oh, gosh, the whole thing it was really, really eventful. And I would just say just meeting really enthusiastic young athletes. You can tell they're so eager to learn and get better. I think that's you know, something that not only motivates them attending these seminars, but it motivates me too. I don't know if you feel the same, but even yeah. just seeing the enthusiasm and excitement from um, up and coming competitors makes me like super excited too and motivated. It does. And for you guys that caught any of the action on our social media, we actually had a few personal training, we'll call it small group training sessions where a few of the athletes got to train alongside their idol with Ashley. And I took them through some group development work how did you like the training? Was it difficult? Was it too easy? It's just right. Actually, it was pretty challenging. And I got to say, I was quite sore after. I mean, <laughs> I did three of the training sessions. Yes. So that's three. not typical. Yeah. I just wanted to join in on the fun. So yeah. I was, I'm still a little sore, to be honest. But it was a great workout. And I love yep. to challenge myself and try some new things. So you were excellent at guiding us and pushing us. and being a cheerleader as well. So I don't think I would have pushed as hard without you, that's for sure. Yeah, you know, it was interesting to see. So Ashley had to go through three full <laughs> glute workouts in about 24 hours. And you know what? I love my job. I get to pick on, you know, novice athletes and I get to pick on Miss <laughs> Olympia sometimes. So uh, definitely keep a lookout. We got some really fun highlights coming back, but it's one of my favorite parts about the job. And just what Ashley said too, a lot of people look at us as kind of influencers and motivation, but it works both ways. You know, when we're training alongside people that are aspiring to be like us, it actually makes us stay on top of our game, yes. right? Because, you know, you can't let them outdo you. You got you to gotta hold your own, right? You can't say that, hey, I worked out with the champ and you know what? She had to give up after three sets. Yeah, <laughs> right? exactly. Yeah. So it is motivating for sure. Uh, you know, Anytime we're down in Hawaii, though, for sure, check us out at GY. We've got some fun things planned. I'm sure we'll be back again soon. Uh, but one of the other things we want to really dive into is part of the reason we strategically chose Hawaii at this particular time of year is... Because we're halfway to Japan right now. That's so right. from us coming from the States, I'm from Vegas and you're from Chicago, just mm -hmm. about the halfway point to Japan. So you know what? Yep. We're here. We're already halfway there. So we might as well 
go to Tokyo and compete in the Tokyo Pro this weekend. <laughs> That's right. So we're, we're excited. She's been to Tokyo. You won a Tokyo show. I think you did, did the November one. Japan Pro. Yes. The November Pro. is the Japan yeah. Pro. And then the August is the Tokyo Pro. But it's yeah. the same production, same promoter, same venue, same everything, just a different name, different time. Mm -hmm. And I got to say, what really brought me back is how epic the stage was. You saw the video of the, the how they... They set up the stage for the pros with yeah. the video effects and the strobe lights. It is a production like none other. And they really do it big here in Asia. It's just, it's yep. crazy. They really take it to the next level. I remember when I competed there uh, last November, I mm -hmm. won the show, like you said. It, there was so much like excitement and so much like hype. And of course the stage is so grand that it felt as if I won the Olympia, even though it was just the Japan Pro that I won. Right. I was treated so well. I, I was treated as if I had won the Olympia. So it, it put the biggest smile on my face. I had such a great time. I had to come back. Absolutely. So, and, and then she drugged me back with her. Yes, I talked to you today. Hey, you were, yeah. you were an, an easy one to convince though. <laughs> you're like, yeah, let's do it. I, that's what I like yeah. about you. You're so like down for it. You're just like, give me the challenge, I'm down, let's do it. That is so cool about you. You're not even, you didn't even hesitate. You're like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so, you know, I love it too. I mean, I think a lot of you guys that follow me probably know that I actually retired from men's physique in 2016 after becoming an Olympian and having a very successful career there. And just what you said, it was actually for the challenge because classic physique came out around that 2016, 2017 period. And that was always kind of my dream physique, my mm -hmm. goal physique. So I was like, you know what? I'm not getting any younger at the time. I'm like early to mid thirties, let's just go for it. So I actually trained and did pretty, you know, I was pretty successful in classic physique, but not as dominant as I was in, in men's physique. Mm -hmm. And I also, as my body got older, it's harder for me to maintain that level of training mm -hmm. uh, because it just takes a toll on your knees and your joints and stuff. So now pushing 40, I was like, you know what? Sure, I'll come back. And honestly, I think when I first agreed, I was still on the fence, like, should I do classic again? Should I, maybe I'll go back to men's physique. The one thing that I found intriguing is that they have the weight cap now. Yes. So that was not a factor back when I was in men's physique. Now for me, the, the scary thing is I've been sitting at 220 pounds plus for eight years and the weight cap is 194 pounds. So I've been up all the way up to 243 pounds in my, in my classic bulks. So I was a little unsure, like, ooh, do I really want that hard of a cut? But here we are. I wake up right now, fast and wait, 194. There you go. We got a few days until check-ins. Yeah, it was almost yeah. like made for you then. That's a weight you can you can pull that off. And do you feel yeah. that at 194, it's a good 194, right? Absolutely. I feel like, I, I know from seeing just photos of you from previously, I think this physique is definitely going to blow the old one out of the water. So definitely. it's going to be really exciting to see you on stage after that time away from a men's physique. But also now that the weight cap is into play, because that, that's a new thing starting this year, correct? Or this yeah. season after the Olympia. So that's going to be very interesting because you'll see that maybe some competitors that used to do well maybe aren't anymore because they're struggling to get down to that weight and it's not really uh, fitting for their physique or their body. Yep. So it's going to be a very interesting year. Um, are you nervous yet or are you confident? You, you ready? I'm confident and I'm ready. I don't really get nervous for shows. I did in the beginning. I get excited. And then I get calm, more calm, the closer I get to the show. Interesting. That's yeah. the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, you know, well, here's the thing is, you know, when I do get nervous is when I know I didn't have a, a good prep or I know I didn't push as hard as I probably could have. But for this particular prep, I gave myself about 14 weeks, which mm -hmm. is a pretty full prep for me. Fast oxidizer, so I yes. cut very fast. And, you know, I felt very confident that I did I follow all the steps, right? I am self-coached right now too, which I'm putting a lot of our PVC principles and a lot of my own experiences and knowledges as a coach into practice on myself, which is kind of fun. A little harder to look at yourself objectively. It is. But I like the challenge. So, you know, one thing I do that is objective, as you guys know, is I rely on data. So blood work, hormones, in-body scans, HTMA mineral analysis. And so I can still see my directional trends over time. It's just the aesthetic part that you have to you usually get some accountability check-ins from you know fellow peers or colleagues if you're self-coached but i'm excited i think it's going to be a blast uh i mean who better to you know share the stage with and yeah. share the event with than yourself it is so fun and not only just the the whole competition experience 
Tokyo itself is a pretty dang cool city. I made yeah. sure to pack very lightly because I know I'm going to bring <laughs> home so many Japanese snacks. They have the coolest yep. snacks over there. So I'm definitely planning on bringing home a lot to share for yeah. everyone. She's not joking. She literally literally has an empty suitcase for snacks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yep, reserved. Yeah. Well, I'm excited. Um, we've got so many experiences that we're going to be um, you know, getting out there in Tokyo. Uh, and again, just piggybacking off of Hawaii. It doesn't get much cooler than that, you know, doing the majority of our peak week right here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's talk about some of the things that we've been doing to help us execute and stay on track. Because I know a lot of you guys out there struggle with this, even when you're not traveling long distance for a show. You know, if you got a busy work schedule, you got kids, you got all these different things going on in the week. And it's, sometimes it's hard to prep your meals. It's hard to squeeze your training and get your cardio in. Let's talk about what things have helped us stay on track way out here in Hawaii, how we're packaging up all of our food and going through customs and going to Tokyo to manage all these things. So I think first and foremost, it's the accountability thing. And we've repeated a few times, we're holding each other accountable, like, nope, we're working out, no slack, and we're doing this and this and this at this time. But I would say also the environment itself is pretty motivating. Like we've yeah. been waking up in the morning just to do some fasted cardio in paradise. It's literal paradise. I can I look out the window and yep. I see the beautiful ocean. I live, we're surrounded by mountains. I feel like we're in a tropical rainforest. It doesn't get much better than this. Sure beats treadmill running of <laughs> looking at a wall, you know? Yeah. So I'm I'm very grateful to be here and I think that you know, this is just like a little sample of what we're going to experience in Tokyo, too, because I feel like once we're going to get there, we're going to be so fired up. But um, to continue on, I would say that, you know, packing, obviously, there you, you got to expect that things that we have there, they might not have in Tokyo, right? Mm -hmm. Things that like maybe some powdered stevia or, you know, vitamins or, or whatever, whatever the case may be. So we always need to make sure our packing is down to a science checklist like make sure we have it all just in case because you never know when you get over there what kind of food you're going to have access to especially right. those very niche diet items um i can't expect i'm going to find it over there so you definitely need to come prepared that's for sure yeah and we've both done a ton of cooking here you know even on the way here i think we both had cooked enough meals you know you bring some on the plane with you so that you have enough food for your travel always expect delays so don't pack exactly just the amount you need always pack extra and then and i'll tell you guys what's in my bag at any given time but then we also try to cook in bulk and then freeze a lot of this stuff so that when you get to your destination you've at least got like that 24 48 hour window to breathe where you're not like immediately scrambling to like hurry up and source food right. you know you've, you've kind of got some buffer time there so for mine on my in my normal backpack I keep extra protein powders, which I don't like to use on peak week unless it's an emergency, but I will definitely use them if, uh, if it's that or miss a meal. I keep extra oats. I keep extra cashews, almonds, so healthy fats, could even be some peanut butter, um, a little bit of everything. So, you know, you've got your carbs, your fats, your proteins covered. I always bring um, extra shaker bottles and things like this that you fill up, right? Yeah. Containers, clearly um, a food scale so you can weigh your stuff out if you're in a pinch. And then, you know, the more challenging part is like all the daily health supplements too. So you gotta be very disciplined and organized. And to Ashley's point, you gotta have a checklist because you will forget something. Yeah. Yeah. And then when we're here, some of our biggest things, you know, we did hit grocery stores at some point. Yes. But we rely heavily on things like Instacart and convenience because mm -hmm. if we can get these things delivered to our door, it saves you that extra step, saves you a little time. And then just cooking in bulk. Mm -hmm. So for the Tokyo one, actually, you know, I actually cooked up my chicken, my tilapia, uh, pre-portioned all of it and all of my carbohydrates and things into uh, freezer bags and then froze about 85% of them. Yeah. I told him mm -hmm. that, you know, there is definitely grocery stores everywhere in Tokyo, but the only yep. thing is in Japan, they seem to have like very small portions. You'll see like they'll sell bananas, like buy just one banana in a wrapper. <laughs> yeah. It's the cutest thing. But the same thing applies to like chicken and vegetables, which isn't really a problem for me because I, I probably eat 25% of the food you eat. Yep. But for someone like Andre, if you know, buying these uh, little chickens, he's probably gonna sell at the yep. store <laughs> <laughs> every, like, day. <laughs> every day. And he's probably yep. not even gonna have enough because it seems like once they sell out, it's not like Costco here where it's like, right. oh, you can buy a 50 pound thing of chicken and there's 
there's a whole warehouse in the back of just chicken. It's not like that. It doesn't seem to be. So everything's small portion. So once they sell out for the day, it seems like that's it. Yeah. So I told him, hey, make sure you have extra just in case you run into that. I don't feel like that's going to be a problem for me. But like I said, I, I don't eat quite as much as you do. So yeah. um, better to be safe than sorry. That's the moral of the story. Just <laughs> better to be safe. Also, also something to mention too is in Hawaii here, you might notice we're not in a hotel room. We're in an Airbnb, which I think is better for fit people like ourselves because we can cook on a, with a full kitchen. We have a full fridge, full freezer, cooking utensils, pots, pans, whereas sometimes at hotels, you mm -hmm. might get a kitchenette, but more times than not, it's just like a mini fridge and a microwave if you're lucky. So right. I think that's something you need to look into as well if you are planning on traveling for a good period of time is make sure that your hotel has necessities that fits your lifestyle. Um, make sure that it has a fridge, um, a freezer, a microwave stove, whatever you need. But also you better research those gyms when you get there too, because yep. you don't want to be somewhere where the gym is so far away. Right. You got to have a plan. And, and it's all about the details here. Like Tokyo, clearly being in a different country, everything's a little bit different, right? So the way that things are laid out, whereas here in the U.S., a lot of the time it's at a host hotel. The ballroom's right downstairs, tanning's right over here, you know, you've got access to all these things in the venue, whereas here it's a little bit more spread out. Yes. Right? And then even little things that you might not think about, like we have to walk maybe five minutes down the street to get our spray tans, but it's going to be 90 plus degrees and, and rainy, rainy <laughs> yeah. which doesn't really mesh well with spray tans. So it's like we've got ponchos, we've got a plan, right? And that's what it comes down to is just pre-planning, make sure you understand where you're going, what those kind of customs and things look like and uh, all the logistics behind it. So you, you know, you don't fall off plan, I guess, and um, put yourself in a bad position for the show. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Training wise too. It's, you know, to Ashley's point here, it's actually been pretty easy. I enjoy waking up, getting the cardio in, right? You got beautiful scenery, taking in the fresh air. And for me personally, I start to deload a lot of my in inputs on peak week. Mm -hmm. So my training volumes and intensity come down about 25% you know, reduce some inflammation. My cardio intensity and duration also comes down significantly as I'm going throughout peak week. So this has honestly been an actual breeze, an ocean breeze, and I don't mind it at all. Uh, and then, you know, just making sure you do have access to a gym, be it, you know, hotel gym, which isn't ideal, but it's better than nothing. Yes. We actually were fortunate enough to have access to, you know, some really good gym equipment while we were out, out here mm -hmm. and just really keep everything on point. Yes. And also, I always bring a resistance band with me just in case. Well, for one, we need it for pumping up from backstage. Yeah. But even if I weren't competing and I'm traveling, I always bring a resistance band because worst case scenario, when I don't have time for a gym or it's just a chaotic morning and I need to be somewhere very soon, I, you know, a pump workout with resistance bands is better than nothing. So the good thing about resistance bands, it doesn't take up much space in your travel luggage. You can take it with you wherever you go. You don't need a, a lot of equipment. You can just do your resistance band, body weight, you know, worst case scenario. But having um, a workout in the morning, I think is a lot uh, easier sometimes because you get it out of the way, especially if you're on vacation, you know, yeah. get it done. Don't have to think about it and continue on with your day. And it's a great way to kind of wake you up a bit too. Oh, for sure. You know, I think the first morning I did a nice little hit circuit yeah. outside. I had a training buddy. I don't know if you guys saw my story on IG, but I had a giant praying mantis that was just looking right over my shoulder the whole workout. So that was my little extra motivation for the day. But it's also about balance, too. I mean, just mentally, you don't want to like go in, you know, where you're just so, I don't even want to call it focused, but you're so obsessed with the show that it takes away from the enjoyment of the process. So we still make sure to mix in fun stuff. In fact, both of your peak weeks, this is your second uh, peak week in Hawaii. We went to Kulo Ranch. Yes, we did. Right? We got to see some cool stuff and go to like Jurassic and all these other, other things. And you know what? It's good. It like mentally balances you out where you're not stressed out about peak week or the show. And it's just mm -hmm. kind of another day. Yeah, absolutely. And mm -hmm. places like here in Hawaii and even Tokyo, mm -hmm. we're getting a lot of steps in which can count yeah. towards your just daily activity, especially for us, we're on peak week. And as you mentioned, we're deloading. We're not like going to have the most intense workouts this week because we don't want to be all inflamed and stressed out. So, you know, getting in those steps is going to be so much easier, even in Tokyo is an even more, I guess, pedestrian friendly yeah. city. So we're going to get so many steps in and we're not even going to realize it because we're going to be seeing all the sites and having so much fun. 
So that kind of, I guess, uh, activity is, is the best because you're having fun and you're getting your exercise in without even it feeling like exercise. Exactly. And it's a little bit of social time too and you're making memories, you know, so it makes Pete Week fly by, I can tell yeah. you that. The other big thing I think a lot of people struggle with even if it's not peak week and they're just on vacation, is hydration. Yes. Oh, so yes. making sure that you get all of your water, but not just water, right? You want your electrolytes in there too. Because a lot of people tend to get bloated just from traveling itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes it's like, you you know, you have too much sodium or whatever. And if you do tend to get that really bad uh, bloat response from sodium, a lot of times your potassium levels are off too. So it's just really about staying well hydrated, getting enough water in, and then balancing your electrolytes. Absolutely. You know? I think that's the biggest mistake people make when traveling, especially if you're trying to stay fit, is mm -hmm. you're so busy doing these fun things, you're enjoying the moment, but you're not drinking as much as you should, you usually would, you know, especially if you're out and about all day and you don't really have access to a restroom. I mean, even for you, you were like, oh, I'm afraid to drink this because I don't, I'm going to have to go to the bathroom and there's none here. So that's something you got to be prepared for, even if that means catching up with water when you get home yeah. or just timing it so that you're not having to use the restroom when you're out and about because who wants to go to the bathroom every 15 minutes right yep. but i think one thing that can really help you when you're traveling and you're trying to get in that fluids is flavoring your water somehow um can be very very helpful because it you will tend to drink more water if it tastes good right so whether that means throwing some lemon juice in it or some propel packets for those electrolytes or yep. crystal light or something like that um, that really encourages me to drink more water because I'm like, hmm, this tastes good. So mm -hmm. it's not a task. It's like enjoyable. Yeah, for sure. And, that, and a lot of people do struggle with that just in general. Yes. But a peak week super important to make, make sure that you keep your water and your le electrolytes or sodium stable and constant as possible. You don't want these big swings throughout peak week. And then, you know, your kidneys sensing that you're producing aldosterone and can make you hold and do all kind of weird, unexpected or unpredictable things. Right. Right. We want to be able to predict that outcome. So definitely focus on that. You know, one other layer of complexity, we talked a little bit about men's physique having a weight cap. So any of you guys that compete in divisions with weight caps, this is definitely a scenario where you absolutely have to pack your home scale and make sure it's a good home scale. I actually calibrate mine against my in-body 570, which I know is medical grade, it's 99%. So as long as I'm within like half a pound of my home scale, I know it's good. I actually just had to throw one away because it freaked me out and it was like five pounds high one day and it was five pounds long. I'm like, something's not right here. And we compared it against the in-body and it was like 5% off, it's way off. So I bring um, you know, a good scale, ideally it's calibrated, and then I monitor my trends, even on peak week, because again, we're balancing a couple things. One is muscle fullness. You know, you want that full, hard and quote unquote dry look. I don't really like the term dry because that implies that you're lacking water. Right. When in reality, it's the fluids and the glycogen in your muscles that are giving you that full, hard look. Uh, but the skin should be dry, right? Extracellular water is what we're referring to. And sometimes you might look your best, but then your weight's over the weight cap three pounds. So we got to manage that. And then other times you might be two or three pounds under the weight cap. So you don't want to risk coming in too depleted or small or flat. And then, you know, the plan changes and we're suddenly playing catch up with the food. I've had to do that twice this week already. Right. So, and I don't mind sharing that. That's actually a good conversation point. I've got my baseline, you know, kind of 10 day out plan and I monitor my weight. So Ashley knows I'm very analytical. I'll monitor my weight three to four, sometimes five times a day. Uh, because it's all good data. And when I look back over a two-week span, I can see what I ate that day and then what was the impact on my body weight over time. And then for me, it's always the overnight drops mm -hmm. because I need to plan that perfectly so that my overnight drop before weigh-ins is exactly where I need it to be. Mm -hmm. I don't want to come in five pounds light. Definitely don't want to come in over the weight cap. Um, so that's the purpose of the, you know, taking the measurements and recordings throughout the week. But there are one or two days, I think the day we went to the ranch, and we were sweating like crazy. It was really dirty out there too. That's another story. We'll have to post some funny pictures later. But I think I dropped an extra three to four pounds of water that day. So I had to play catch up the next day. It's supposed to be a low carb day. Mm -hmm. Actually had over that day and a half about 700 grams of carbs. Yeah. So yeah. fill me back out. And then now I'm hovering right back at stage weight. So yeah. And I think yeah. there's something to be said too. It's like whenever you're traveling to compete, and it, let's say it's a place that's quite far away from your usual time zone and your, your home state or whatever. So, for example, Tokyo is perfect. Yeah. Very uh, different time zone, very far away. 
different climate. I'm coming from dry Vegas and here in Hawaii, super humid. Tokyo should also be quite humid. But anytime you're competing far away in different time zones, different climates, you'll probably want to come there a few days earlier than what you would expect, even for the reasons that you kind of just explained. Sometimes you can be behind on water. Um, when you land, it, some people will start to retain water depending on the climate mm -hmm. um, in different scenarios like that. And some people are just really sensitive to flying and holding water too. I'm sure many of you guys who have flown before who are listening to this podcast have had that experience that one time where you've had a really long flight and you got off the plane and your ankles were swollen and your sock line is like, you can see where your socks were and <laughs> yep. your ankles. I'm sure we can all relate to that part. So when we're competing, we don't want to play risks like that because what if you landed and you're retaining water and then you compete the next day? That's no good because you mm -hmm. probably don't have enough time to catch up and let your body acclimate to the environment, the time zone, sleeping and everything like that. So for us, we're, we're coming in uh, to Tokyo quite early. So we'll get there Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. um, let's just say our first full day in Tokyo would be Wednesday and we compete Sunday. So that's just an example. We're coming in several days early just in case our body experiences any fluctuations and also so that we can get more on the time zone of Tokyo with our sleep because we don't want to be going to bed when our show is happening. We don't want right. to get into that um, time zone that we're so used to because if we were just to carry on our typical um, sleep pattern from back home, we would be sleeping while we're competing <laughs> and competing while we're sleeping. So we don't, we don't want that. So come early if you are competing. The further away, the earlier you'll have to come. I do think Ashley's one of the few people that could compete while she sleeps. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, but that's a good point, though. So, you know, make sure that you give yourself enough time to get acclimated because your circadian rhythm is going to be all over the place, especially for us, because we just experienced two massive time zone changes, you know, from kind of four to six hour changes. And now another I don't even know how many hour changes. I can't keep up with it, but we're time traveling right now. And then the other part to remember is the time zone change itself. So when you're planning out your meal timing, especially if you have no choice but to travel into the show very close to the show, like a day before, you got to remember you might be losing a day or gaining a day based on the time zone shift. And I, I remember that was one of the biggest mistakes I made my very first international show when I did the Russia Napa Pro back in the day. And I had everything mapped out to a science, right? I was fresh off the Olympia stage. My peak weeks had been excellent those those last three shows so i'm like it's just wash rinse repeat like two mm -hmm. weeks after the olympia and i nail all my meals on the plane and then i it dawned on me as i'm arriving i'm like oh my god i just lost eight hours and it's the next day already and it's time for the press conference and weigh-ins and i'm just like ooh, i did not time that right oh. so i missed a whole eight hour window that i was planning to sleep and actually had to go straight from the airport into the press conference get my tan and then go on stage in a couple hours. So it blew up my, my plan. I still did pretty well, but just keep that in mind. Like you have to, it comes back to that pre-planning, make sure you count for any significant time zone changes. Absolutely. All right, guys, well, we are about out of time, but I definitely encourage you to follow along on our social and check out the action for this Tokyo Pro Super Show. We're gonna be doing all kinds of fun stuff out there. Um, and then Ashley, where can they find you on Instagram and YouTube? I'm Ashley K. Fit on Instagram and Ashley Kaltwasser on YouTube. All right. You guys know where to find me. It's Andre Adams underscore official on Instagram and YouTube. You can also follow up by shooting me an email directly at trainingbydre at gmail.com or visit the website andreadamsofficial.com and make sure to check out the next big seminar we have, which is going to be December 7th. I've got the king of bodybuilding himself, eight-time Mr. Olympia, Ronnie Coleman, and the queen of bodybuilding, four-time, soon-to-be five-time Miss Olympia, Andrea Shaw. And they're going to be coming out to Snap Fitness Kenosha. We've got a huge fashion show and seminar and all kind of fun stuff. So make sure you hop on the website, check it out, get your golden tickets before it's too late. All right. We will see you guys next time on the Peak Physique Podcast.